people come to book signings. My friend was gonna come, but he doesn't want to talk to you. He hates you. <laughs> And it's much harder knowing that it's not your fault either. Like, you well, I pulled the trick. You did. Yeah. But, but, on, on the other hand, though, it, all these characters have to die at some point. Says who? And, yeah. <laughs> we may not have to know about it, but then, you know, there's not Says who? Maybe they are. But you said you were convinced for the right reasons. I mean, can you? Sh what are the right reasons for killing a major character? Like they had said after, you know, hundreds of books and thousands of side products that People have become so complacent that there was no tension left in the books. And I think that's probably true. Not the Wookiee, man. Not the Wookiee. Kill Luke. <laughs> I'm curious who would have preferred that. Anyway. Good, pretty good sized Luke contingent for the killing. The Luke killing contingent. I, I, I picture them going to George's office with like this hit list. Which one, George? <laughs> Kill the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so um, io9 has a great article up asking several authors what their biggest writing setback or stumbling block was and, uh, and how they overcame it. So how would, how would you answer that question personally? Um, well, I, uh, do I want to even say that get into that? Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> all right, you know what it is to be a writer? What it is to be a writer is to know with certainty that no matter how many letters you get from kids saying, I never read a book until, no matter how many letters you get from people who are maybe fighting cancer, um, who are saying they're finding hope and inspiration in your characters, no matter how many times you hear from a kid who says, I never had any friends in high school and your books were my friends and Dritz was my friend, no matter how many letters you get from a soldier in Afghanistan saying, you know, I, I thank you for letting me forget what I had to do today and what I'm going to have to do tomorrow. No matter how many awards you win, no matter how many bestsellers you have, no matter how many parades you get to sit on the back of a Mustang in, no matter any of that, and especially in the age of, an internet, of the internet, the, to be an author is to know with certainty that there is always going to be someone more than happy and willing and excited to shout out to the entire world how much you suck. Okay? And the megaphone just keeps getting And this really just started coming into play beyond belief around the time that book came out that we were just talking to. Now I have to set this up. I had to cancel my book tour for that New Jedi Order book, Factor Prime, because the day I was supposed to be at the World Trade Center, Borders, this was in 1999, so it was still there, to stop the book tour was the day, the day my brother, who was my best friend in the entire world, was having his last MRI, where they basically said, we can't do it anymore. He had pancreatic cancer, 19 months of hell. But anyway, so I had to cancel the book tour. My brother passed away a couple weeks later. The book came out. Death threats started coming in. Hate mail started coming in. Um, for, I would say, about two years, and I'll be, I'll be honest about this, I would go to places like Amazon.com and I would look for one-star reviews to feel the pain of them. And the reason I was doing that, and, and I, it took me about two years to figure out that the reason I was doing that is because I couldn't actually face what was really bothering me, which was the fact that I just lost my best friend in the world. Um, it took me about two years to get past that. That was, that was a rough, rough time. Um, and the way I got out of it was just by going through the natural grieving process and getting past that, which we, you know, you do, you go on with your life. But also, that book that I wrote at the time when he was sick, a book called Mortalis, the fourth, fourth book of Demon Wars, was my catharsis. And I went back and took a look at that again, and it got me through it. But that, I, it, it's hard for me to explain to people, you know, this whole fame and fortune deal. Keep the fame. Send me the royalty check. <laughs> the, the, it can be such, you know, to read in the Washington Post that I had to cancel my, the Washington Post, I had to cancel my tour to stay home with my dying brother. Who no one in the family knew was dying at that point. <laughs> Except for very few of us. 
was was pretty tough. So that was that was definitely sorry to bring you all down to the convention. But I'm over it, so you should be too. Um, so that was that was tough, and, and I, I've actually had to. I've, I've actually been asked to bring other authors under my When we see young authors coming up and they're all happy and they, they get their first book published and eight of their friends go and give them five star reviews and they, yeah, 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 and nobody knows them yet. And I'm like, keep your feet on the ground and be ready. And then the, the assault starts. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that, that was my biggest stumbling block right there. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being willing to share that with us, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Many fans who would not leave you one-star reviews in the audience today who would love to uh, ask you some questions if, if you have some time for that. And if you ask a question, we will also give you a Sword and Laser t-shirt if we, if we call on you and ask your question. So if you want to, um, should we pass the mic around or should they come up? Come up? Okay. Come on up to There's the a microphone the up here. A world that you want to write in that you've never been asked to write in that you would, are just like, burn enough to write about. Yeah, there was a world called Amalore. <laughs> Where that story was going. No, you don't even, no, you can't even say that because 2006, I get a phone call. I'm sitting at home, and the phone rings. Now, I'm living in Massachusetts. I'm part of Red Sox Nation. Yeah! yeah we got beat 22 last night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so Go I'm Giants! <laughs> so I'm sitting at home, and yeah, you got all our players now. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> And the phone rings, and I pick up the phone, the guy on the other end says, can I talk to Bob Salvatore? And I said, speaking. And he goes, oh man, I can't believe I'm talking to you, my favorite author, this is Kurt Schilling. Yeah. <laughs> and bloody sock guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, screw you. you know? <laughs> my wife is laughing, because his publicist had called earlier. And so I finally figured out it really is Kurt Schilling calling me. And um, I'm like, oh, I can't believe I'm talking to you. And he's like, I can't believe I'm talking to you. I'm like, I can't believe I'm talking to you. It's only 20 minutes. <laughs> And he told me he was getting ready to retire, but he didn't want to go sell used cars or anything. And, and what he really wanted to do was start a video game company. And would I come in and create a world for him? <laughs> and so I did. And there's a world called Amalore. And I had this incredible team that, first I had my own Dungeons and Dragons group that I got together because I only had two months to do all the research and get it. I had this idea that I can't even talk about now because it's in bankruptcy court and the state of Rhode Island will shoot me if I say anything. I had this idea that I thought really kind of culminated everything I've pulled out of fantasy in my life as you know, what it's done for me and enriched my life. And I had this idea to kind of bring everything together in one place. And I wasn't sure it was going to work or not. And I brought it in and I, I showed the narrative team and everybody got on board. The art team got on board. This was in 2006. And we spent the next three to four years building a 10,000 year history of this world. And I did the first 5,000 years, and with help, and then the narrative team spread, and then they, and I guided them on the next 5,000 years. And then we purchased a company called Big Huge Games from a company called THQ, and they were doing a single player RPG. And so they, they, had a, they built an engine for it, we took our art assets and put it on their engine and it worked beautifully, and they came up with a game last year called Reckoning. And in Reckoning, my job, I, I really didn't, I didn't write the story for Reckoning. Everyone thinks I did. No, I did not. That credit, and it's some, of the, some of the story writing in that is brilliant. It's, that credit goes to the narrative team at Big Huge Games. They were amazing and they were wonderful and I, I just love that team. My job was to listen to their ideas for the various storylines and bring them into the bigger world. Find ways that we could help connect it. It was me and two other guys who were really in charge of the intellectual property at 38 Studios, we would sit down with this team and just help coax them over to some of the themes we were trying to hit. Because the whole point of doing this world was the philosophy behind it, as much as anything else. Like, it's not enough, if you, we were making an MMO, a World of Warcraft type game. Now, an MMO, you know you're going to come back when you die. Okay, I'll just give you an example of how we thought about Amalore. You know you'll come back when you die. That's a given in an MMO, otherwise no one would play. You either you spawn naked in the city and gotta go get your corpse in EverQuest. You spawn in the graveyard in Warcraft and right, and your ghost has to go back to your corpse. So we wanted to add a little twist to that. And so that was that's the first level, you know you're coming back. And so we came up with something called the Well of Souls. And this is kind of explaining why you're coming back. 
But anyone can do that, right? That's easy. You can just come up with a name for something. That's the second level. And then the third level is the will of souls was developed over 5,000 years by the gnomes for a specific reason that made sense within the world. That's the third level. And then the fourth level is, this is where I really challenge the narrative teams. I said, what would happen in this world if all of a sudden they had an immortality machine? Because that's what we've got. What does that mean? Well, everyone would be happy. No, that's not what it means. Think about it. What happens to the church whose entire power base is predicated on an afterlife? What about all those people who are fabulously rich and powerful at the head of the church who are suddenly nobody needs them or wants them anymore? Are they going to be happy about it? They may use their money to buy it, but are they going to be happy about losing their power? What about the mother who lost her son? And now is aging and is just waiting for the day when she can pass on because she believes that she's going to see her child again in the afterlife. Is she going to want to go through the machine? What about the, what kind of emotions might the last person whose child or husband or wife or mother died right before the, those things became active, what might they be going through? And this is what Armalore was all about. So we had all these people arguing and going to different levels further and further. And what you saw in Reckoning, I, I can't even, everyone says oh, it's a fate-based world, and no, it's not at all. That is a slice this big of a pie, a time and place this tiny to what we had. And the whole thing is under lock and key now. And it's killing it. <laughs> Because I had a prequel book I was going to write, I got short stories I've written there, and they're all in the vault in Rhode Island. Oh, well, all right. Well, thank you very much for answering my question. Except for a couple of Chewy fans. No. <laughs> no, it, it, I don't think Joe Axel ever hated Drizzt. I think a lot of people did in his society. but. When, whenever you're doing things like that, what I try to do is, I, I, I want to know my characters. I don't know my characters when I start writing about them. They tell me who they are, and then I let them keep talking. Because I don't, like, want, I don't think anyone gets up in the morning and says, oh, I think I'll do evil today, you know? So if I have a bad guy, an Adam Centrary, for example, there has to be something, there's a reason. I don't want just the psychopath. That's a, occasionally you get the psychopath who just likes to blow things up. Um, but by following those characters along, and remember, you're only intersecting with them a lot of times if it's the tertiary characters, like Jarl Axel will bounce in and bounce up, right? And same with Intrary in the early books. The, whenever they come back, I want to know where they've been and what they've been doing and why they're back. And I'm, so when I, when I look at characters, I'm always looking for why they're doing what they're doing. I know that I'll be writing a story, and this happens to me all the time. I never know what's going on on the next page. Like I write an outline, I start writing, I throw the outline away. And I let the characters take me on an adventure. And sometimes I see the characters doing something that's really weird or developing this real hatred for somebody, like you talked about. And instead of saying, oh, they can't do that, and erasing it, you know, hitting, control off the lead or whatever. Um, I say, why are you acting like that? And they tell me. And, it, and I don't think Jarl Axel hates Dritz at all, but if you've noticed in the more recent books, he got really mad at Dritz when Dritz stopped being Dritz, which I thought was very cool, because that's when I learned a lot about Jarl Axel that I didn't know, after 23 years. You see? I see. They tell me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I, uh Oh, I, I, I love reading, uh, Michael Shara is a favorite, and now Jeff Shara, the um, Civil War history with Shara, the, the Killer Angels, I think is one of the best kind of history books I've ever read, even though it was fictionalized, but it really wasn't, based on Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, James Joyce, uh, if you ever get cocky as a writer, read the last four pages of The Dead out loud, and you shall be humbled. <laughs> it's brilliant writing, it's, I wish I could write like that. Um, and I like reading. There are, I like reading a lot of the bloggers today. I think um, two in particular, just for the writing, Tana Hazy Coates and Matt Taibbi, just for the writing. But even when I completely disagree with them, okay, I want to go punch them in the mouth. They're brilliant writers. 
And I, you see a lot of that out there. Um, so the, I, I spend a lot of time reading those, because I don't have time. I can't sit down and read novels the way I want to because it interferes with the writing and I'm always right. So I have to kind of really pick and choose the novels I want to read. But thank you. First thing I tell every writer, that everyone tells me I want to be a writer, is if you can quit, quit. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny. If you can quit, quit. Because if you can quit, you're not a writer. Writers can't quit. This is as much a curse as a blessing. You get stories inside, you're clawing at your skin to get out. And the writing part of it has to be what's important to you. I, you know, when people, people think, and I, I encounter people like this all the time, I'm gonna, I have a great idea for a book, I'm going to write a book and make all this money and be famous. And it's like, that's, that's just not the way the world works. Um, the writing part, every day you wake up, you have a term paper due and you haven't started it yet. That's what it is to be a writer. And so you better love the writing. So if you can't quit, you're over the first hurdle. More practical advice, when I got my first rejection letter, I talked to Robert Cormier, a guy from my hometown, wrote I Am the Cheese, The Chocolate War, brilliant young adult novelist. And his phone number was actually in I Am the Cheese. That was his actual phone number. So I called him up. He but he had spoken to one of my classes when I was in high school. And I, I, he kept me on the phone for like three hours. And what he basically told me is character is more important than plot. I never thought of it this way before. He said, but you can have the best plot in the world, but if you have lousy characters that nobody cares about, the book fails. But if you have characters that people care about, you give them a hangnail and they're on the edge of their seat. So to, I think character is more important than plot. And I think most beginning writers tend to get hung up on having this amazing story with all these twists and turns. Even complicated worlds like Wheel of Time, A Song of Ice and Fire, the storylines aren't that complex. When you really get down to it, it's just characters, human nature taking over and people doing things people do. Right? So character mode plan. And then the third thing, which is the most basic, write every day. You have to write every day. There's no such thing as writer's block. Writer's block is lack of confidence. And if you have that, get out now. Sit down and write. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, I don't know what I'm going to do. Start hitting the keys, something will happen. You may throw it all out tomorrow, but at least your mind is being forced back into your work. And then when you're done, for God's sakes, read it out loud to yourself. <laughs> I, and I don't mean, I mean, hotel, Hilton room, crystal ballroom, time Saturday, 2.30 p.m. Because when you read it like that, what you're doing is you're reading it the way a reader with the approximate speed that most readers will be reading it. You will catch H-T-E, <laughs> right? You will catch Tahi, which is the one that the spell checker doesn't catch, instead of to the, right, Tahi. You will find, if all of your sentences have the same structure that you are going da 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 and you'll be bored out of your mind and you'll change sentence structure. And you will find sentence fragments that are kind of, how did that get in there? It makes no sense. Read it out loud to yourself. Thank you so much. Well, actually, that did happen to me. It was a character, Brother Francis in Demon Wars. And the first three books of Demon Wars, it's, it's about, uh, Demon Wars really takes place, the centerpiece of it is the church. And so I need monks. I have these monks all over the place. And, you know, I've got my main cast of characters, but it's a huge book. Demon Wars has a hundred different storylines going on. So I needed kind of like, you know, the, the extra in the, high school play monk to come in and say one line here and one line there. And that was Brother Francis. Whenever I needed a monk to come in and say, the boat is here, master, it would be Brother Francis. Because I couldn't keep coming up with names, for one thing. <laughs> and then I started writing that book, Mortalis, that I talked about. And all of a sudden, as I got about three quarters of the way through the book, I realized, oh my god, this is Brother Francis's book. And it was really subtle and quiet. And I went back and I looked at the evolution of that character. And it blew me away. And I had never expected that to happen. So, Brother Francis, absolutely. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. So, as a, as a writer, you obviously, you mentioned that you don't get to read much. But I was wondering from all three of you, what are the books, the probably one for each, I guess, all October, that you are most anticipating uh, upcoming, re just getting to read, even if it's an older book, just something you are going to get to read soon? Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, Red Country, Joe Abercrombie, is the most, the one that's nearest to being released coming out that I'm, I'm looking forward to. The one I'm most anticipating reading is probably Cloud Atlas, which I'm looking forward to a lot. You're starting on that? <laughs> I already started that one. <laughs> Well, for me, it's actually a book that's already out, but I haven't gotten a chance to read it yet. I had heard that Terry Brooks was um, putting Shannon together with his um, his uh, Night of the Word stuff, running with the Demon books, and, and I want to see how he did that because I've been I love his Night of the Word books, so um, I want to go read that. And then the other book I really want to read again is A Canical Philippe. It's by Walter Miller, which is like my second favorite book of all time. Behind Love It. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here. Right, The email address is feedback at swordandlaser.com and make sure you check out the show on Geek and Sundry on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash geek and sundry or the audio podcast which you can find on iTunes or at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you guys next year. Bye.